so we're we're still waiting for some of our our speakers to join. Um, but in the meantime, I would just like to welcome all of you. Um, I would first like to thank the Center for Open Science team um, for really putting on um, helping us with all the logistics and everything um, with putting on this uh, program. Uh, they deserve a lot of credit. Um, and and uh, I would like to just uh, introduce the session. Um, well, first of all, uh, um, myself. So I'm Christopher Erdman from uh, SciLife Lab. So we provide research data infrastructure for the life sciences in Sweden. And I'm also part of GoFair um, and San Diego Supercomputing Center. Um, I, uh, I'm here to sort of introduce a session on ongoing activities um, uh, to advance open science at the US federal agencies um, following the, the launch of a year of open science. Um, and uh, we've heard a lot about this and this is our chance. Uh, I think, you know, when we were putting together this program, we were we we're really excited to hear from um, some of the agencies, so uh, NSF and NIH and DOE, and uh, and thankfully they responded to the call. And so we have uh, Martin Halbert from the NSF, and I'll, I'll let uh, Martin introduce himself uh, later on. Uh, Susan Gregorik from the NIH and uh, Brian Hitson from um, DOE. Um, just a, a a little sort of. Um, background so we're, we're we're going to be talking about sort of the activities involved in the year of open science uh, so that can range from anything from strengthening uh, strengthening open science policies to promoting incentives for open uh, research practices um, and we also sort of cover the the public access plan which has uh, been mentioned in earlier calls as well earlier talks um, and uh, just a sort of logistics here we'll hear from um, each speaker for about 15 minutes. Um, we have um, we we have the Q&A, we have the chat. I, I will be uh, relaying their slides so you can follow along, but later we'll have Q&A, so it'll be our opportunity to, to ask them any, any questions that you may have. Um, so uh, without further ado, I will introduce a uh, colleague, uh, um, Martin Halbert from the NSF and introduce yourself, Martin. Thank you, Chris. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you, yeah. Great. Um, so I'm, my name is Martin Halbert. I'm the Science Advisor for Public Access at the uh, U.S. National Science Foundation. And I'm really delighted to be here today uh, to talk to you uh, in this concluding plenary of what has been, I think, an amazing uh, webinar, uh, conference, hybrid conference. Um, I am going to go ahead and start my slides then. And Chris, can you give me a thumbs up that those are coming through okay? Yeah, it's coming through. Awesome, awesome. So um, this uh, has been a great event, like I said, and uh, I sat through all the sessions yesterday, um, although there, there were so many uh, breakouts that I couldn't, obviously, we, we can't attend all of them, but I learned a tremendous amount. I think this is a, a marvelous opportunity for us to reflect on this, um, the accomplishment of the Federal Year of Open Science. Uh, and especially in this session, we want to talk a little bit about ongoing activities in this space and this transition or pivot point from the Year of Open Science in 23 towards this future state that we're calling uh, a future of open science and what we mean by that. So um, in this short session, what I'm gonna do is give you just a little bit of context about the genesis of the year of open science, our aims in it, uh, a little bit of context about NSF uh, and its participation in open science prior to the year of, of open science 23, and then a little bit about our current activities and going forward and things that I'm looking forward to in coming uh, months and years. So just a word about uh, the 23 year of open science and what led to it. There were a lot of open science developments that agencies were undertaking in 22, the year before it. Um, certainly you're gonna hear about some of these in this session, the NIH, data management and sharing policy, which was then imminent uh, in and in going into effect in the, the coming year, 23, 
You uh, heard a bit yesterday from Shell Gentleman about the NASA TOPS initiative that was brewing up in 22. And at NSF, we were busy uh, announcing, competing this thing called the Pharos RCN program that I will talk about momentarily. Um, it, uh, which, and those projects took effect in uh, 23, and we will talk a bit about them. Uh, all of these activities were really, you know, uh, jump started into like a sort of supercharged or something when the Nelson Memorandum came out August 22nd of 22. And as we all sort of realized, wow, 23 is going to be a, a really dynamic year with all of these activities going on. We began to think, well, you know, several of us in, in different agencies started thinking, well, what can we do to, to synergize? You know, how can we take advantage of this moment and um, synergize all these activities in the best way possible? And as we talked about it, the uh, idea that came to us was to identify 2023 as a year of open science. Uh, especially for federal agencies that were seeking to catalyze efforts in this space. Uh, as we were all planning on posting our new public access plans from the Nelson, called for from the Nelson Memorandum and all these other synergistic activities, we just thought that it was an opportune moment to uh, make a sort of a, a stake in the ground, a statement about the importance of open science um, to our, our respective agencies. And that's what we ended up doing. So. The year of open science, I think, has been, it was a celebration and a statement um, about the priority and importance of open science policies and processes by the federal agencies that participated in it, which are the primary funders of research in the United States. Well, okay, so we did uh, the year. Uh, what comes next? Well, we thought quite a bit about this in the course of 23, and uh, realized that we wanted to make it clear that this wasn't the end of the story, but rather the beginning, and that we're now transitioning into a future of open science with a period that we see as continuing uh, our, our movement and momentum towards open science goals. Uh, and the point I want to make here is that in some ways, uh, the year of open science was the easy part. It was the part on, you know, sort of the, the mom and apple pie statements of you know, our support by agencies and research communities in open science principles and goals. And the challenges that we're now facing and that we're going to face going forward are the more, the, the more detailed ones of actually realizing those goals, implementing all these changes, these, these cultural practices that are so hard to uh, inculcate in scientific communities and scientific practices. So open science is going to, my main point is that it's going to require us to think and um, deeply internalize this notion that th this is going to require ongoing and continued change efforts. Nobody likes change, but it is, it does lead to better things when you improve things. So that is kind of the core point about going forward and our ongoing activities. But let me start to uh, say a few things about um, first, uh, before I get to all those things, I'm going to give you a little bit of context. So all of us, of course, have to have a gratuitous slide about our, our agencies in this uh, upcoming one on NSF. Let me not only give you the usual stats, but a point that not many people are aware of, uh, a, a few points that people may not be aware of about NSF. So while everybody know, presumably knows NSF, we're an independent federal agency, um, perhaps unusual in, in among federal agencies in that we support all branches of science and engineering. We're not focused on large clusters of areas like health or, or energy, like my colleagues are, are gonna talk about, but rather we, we address all areas of science. So we're spread pretty broadly. Um, and uh, you have some stats there about the number of awards we, that we do in a typical year, 12,000 awards typically. We reached uh, over 300,000 researchers in, with this funding and fund 2,000 educational institutions in a typical year, accounting for about 25% of the federal support for higher education research efforts. Now, something that a lot of people don't know about NSF is uh, in our original 
uh, sort of founding document, incepting document by Vannevar Bush at the conclusion of World War II. Vannevar Bush was, the, of course, the chief uh, head of research efforts in the wartime period. And he was asked to chair this report about where to go from there uh, with the incredible uh, results that science had produced in the Second World War. Well, this was led to this famous 1945 report, Science, the Endless Frontier, which incepted not only NSF ultimately through a congressional act in 1950, but uh, also I would argue our fundamental conception of the modern publicly funded research landscape. Well, something that a lot of people don't know in the very, when you, when you go through the original report and I would direct you to the 75th anniversary edition of it that you can find online, publicly accessible, uh, the very last appendix talks about what we would now term public access. And I think it's remarkable that they articulated it so well in 1945, right? In a period when they're coming out of a wartime period when uh, scientific secrets were, were essential to security, winning the war and so forth. But already then they could understand that public dissem dissemination of publicly funded research was a basic public good and something that we have to move towards. So it is kind of in our DNA at NSF and something that we think a lot about. So many, I, I won't go through the background of the 2013 Holdren Memorandum. Most people are familiar with it. It was the first, I think it's notable because it was the first federal uh, commitment to the basic proposition that publicly funded research outputs should be publicly accessible. At NSF, it resulted in our 2015 NSF first public access policy, NSF document 1552. It led to a wonderful collaboration with our partners at uh, DOE, uh, the Office of Science and Technology Information. And you're gonna hear from Brian in just a moment. I wanna thank Brian up front for a wonderful collaboration of almost 10 years now that we've had with DOE in developing our joint infrastructure the, in, in, at NSF, our public access repository that DOE develops and runs for us. So I wanna thank them. They've been fantastic collaborators. Um, we, uh, to say the obvious, if, you don't, if you're not familiar with how it works, um, in the course of annual reporting, NSF PIs uh, deposit copies of either manuscripts or the version of record uh, to satisfy the public access requirement directly in research.gov. It's integrated with par.nsf.gov. And uh, it has been a, a strong backbone um, of our public access efforts ever since. Now, this thing has, has grown. Let me give you just some stats about it. Uh, this is the same growth information represented as both bar charts and numbers. Um, without delving into all these numbers a lot, there, just a couple of observations. Um, there is a lag in when, while this chart, the bar chart is portrayed as publications associated with a given year, what you can already see uh, and is exemplified by that 2023 column is not that we have less publications in uh, by our researchers in 23, but rather there is a lag time of, of up to a year in the reporting cycle of when that stuff gets into the repository. Um, so you sort of see these, these bars go up over time, over the uh, one to two year period after the particular publication year happens. Now, the other thing I'll point out, you, you can't see all the colors all that well in this chart, but um, the thing I wanna draw your attention to is heretofore we've only required deposit of publications. That little dusting of red that you see there of data sets, we, we implemented in 2021 the capability optionally for researchers to deposit or make publicly accessible data sets in public uh, access repositories and register them through PAR. So slightly different from the way that we do papers and publications. And um, what we should anticipate as we go into 25, 26 and 27, and after the Nelson uh, memorandum requirements go into effect is a lot more red. In fact, I was at a presentation yesterday of people that have done some analysis of it. What you would see if we had been requiring data sets in this period would be very large blocks of red uh, deposits each year of data sets uh, up to about 115,000. 
So right now we've got just on um, just around about a, uh, a third of a million items in NSF par, and it is continuing to grow probably now north of 60,000 items per year. And we anticipate that will grow, uh, grow significantly as we move into data sets and other format types. Um, I want to call out the importance of the NSTC Subcommittee on Open Science, or SOS. Um, it has been a fantastic collaborative community for us in the federal space to work on these topics together. It is comprised of a large number of individuals, over 160 individual representatives of dozens of different federal agencies, has a lot of different working groups, and has really dynamically synergized our activities. Um, NSF is a co-chair of the overall Subcommittee on Open Science and is actively involved in all its working groups. And it has really framed our thinking um, in collaborative ways through products like this thing I've called out on the right, a document that took us a while to come to consensus on, but I think is important, desirable characteristics for data repositories for federally funded research. So this brings me up to the Nelson Memorandum. I again won't go through this because everybody's familiar with it at this point, the major departure, the new updates to the, the public access uh, mandates of the federal government in terms of zero embargo of both publications and data sets. Um, some things I will call out is that it does have a multi-phase uh, series of rollouts in both 25 and 27. And we are right now um, within the agency working on several key implementation decisions uh, and decisions on these things within the agency. I will note, and if you've read our Public Access 2.0 plan, NSF 23-104 is the document number. You find it real easily on the internet. Um, equity concerns are a primary driver in our policy and implementation thinking as in ways that I may mention here. Um, but let me keep moving. We've done a lot of community engagement on these topics of public access. We were at pains. Uh, because of the nature of NSF to really hear from our communities that we serve um, about the, uh, you know, what their perspectives are as we go forward with this. We've held half a dozen well-attended major public engagement webinars and many, many smaller sessions. Also, you may have seen because of these equity concerns, we did a targeted RFI to invite public or anonymous or attributed feedback on our PA2 plan with some particular focus on uh, equity issues. Um, I said I would say a little bit about our Pharos RCN program. This was our, our premier our sort of a featured initiative as part of the Year of Open Science. And it was the inaugural competition uh, and a first of its kind major NSF program focused on catalytic improvements directly on open science and the FAIR data guiding principles, hence the name Pharos. Um, RCNs are research coordination networks. And uh, another thing that was unusual about the, the program is it represents a true cross-agency commitment to open science. All the NSF disciplinary directorates um, funded awards and made uh, commitments in this space to disciplinary progress in open science in the particular ways that make sense to and, and are of consequence in particular disciplines. Uh, they, we funded ultimately 10 three-year multi-institutional national projects um, comprised of 28 separate in, uh, individual institutional awards, total of 12.5 million. We're now uh, engaged in fostering the community of the Pharos RCN projects to encourage synergistic collaboration and national leadership efforts by these projects in advancing open science. We are, um, we learned a lot in doing this competition. We're analyzing the program with an eye to the future. Um, while we can't talk about new uh, competitions before they are, are released, before they're done, please stay tuned for new announcements. Uh, we learned a lot and we've thought a lot about how to best catalyze continued innovations and adoption of open science practices in this space. Um, and I am, I am almost, I will rush uh, through these last slides, Chris. Sorry, I'm running over a little bit. Uh, just to mention of some, some additional synergistic NSF programs. We fund a lot in these spaces. I do want to call out the, uh, the various agencies uh, that are collaborating in the year of open science and our transition to the future of open science. Let me conclude with two slides. One, I'm indebted to the uh, PI and uh, participants of our a project we funded, the Informate Project, 
that identified, I think, a really useful term, the global research infrastructure uh, that they have been using to uh, frame their research activities. Um, that, let me point out that, and they, they have a lot to say about how the different elements of PIDs and uh, metadata comprise this global research infrastructure of repositories and services and so forth. Um, the point I wanna make is that the aims in section four of the Nelson Memorandum, which had to do with the 2027 phase of implementation. What I realized the other day is that they are ultimately contributing to the creation of a global knowledge graph of science. Um, you will hear from Susan about uh, something called the Proto-OKN uh, collaboration, interagency collaboration, and you may very well have heard about the NAIR, the National AI Resource Pilot Projects. All of these are um, the kind of the devils in the details of how good the quality, the, the quality control on our metadata and efforts to identify research outputs through PIDs are. Um, NSF and DOE OSTI are now actively exploring uh, possibilities in this space. So let me conclude with this slide about just what I think um, three characteristics of the future of open sciences, what if people ask us, what does the future of open science mean? Um, well, I think it means active collaboration between funding agencies and research communities to specifically to advance open science policies and practices, practical and detailed endeavors to advance open science in particular disciplinary contexts. And then finally, a focus on the changes of the culture of scientific research to realize the benefits of open science and um, thereby improve our collective community ability to undertake research. Thank you. Sorry I ran over a, a couple minutes, Chris. No, perfectly fine. Um, there, there are two questions actually awaiting for you um, in the Q&A, some clarifying questions. Uh, so if sure. you can go there do, and answer. Do we want to do questions as we go along or do we want to do all the presentations and then go to a well, group when I... Yeah, we'll do all the presentations and then we'll get to okay. questions, but it looks like a question that you can you can answer. We'll do. We'll do. Um, but in the, yeah, next up we have Susan Kergurik uh, from the NIH. Uh, hey, hey, Susan. So uh, <laughs> I I will be presenting her slides. Let me just uh, um, share my screen um, and then hand it over to you, Susan. So hopefully this this will work here. I have your slides queued up. I think. Um, awesome. No problem. If it doesn't, I can jump in. Oh, you can do it. Did you test uh, yourself? Uh, oh, well? no, I didn't test it, but I'm hoping this is very similar to the other Zooms. <laughs> Here we go. They're coming up. <laughs> Lovely. They look great. Yeah. Um, so I will, um, I'll mute myself and you can start. So thank you. And thanks, Chris, and to Brian and to Martin. I'm super happy that I'm able to join today and, and so nice to see everyone as well. What a great opportunity to talk about open science. I, I'm, this has just been a fabulous year and there's been so much progress across the federal agencies and I loved um, you know, hearing from you, Martin. So let me pick up the ball and tell you a little bit about what's happening at, at NIH. And so if we can go to the next slide, this is our canonical mission statement slide. It won't surprise you to hear that, you know, our focus is on health. It's in our title. We are the largest public funder of biomedical and behavioral research. Um, we are a driving force behind the decades of advancements that improve health and revolutionize science and serve our society. Our work isn't finished when we um, create and deliver new scientific discoveries. Really, our work is finished when all of our citizens are living long and healthy lives. Again, health is in our title, it's, it's our bread and butter. Our research encompasses the laboratory, the clinic and the community. We have made an immense progress in accelerating scientific methods such as new data analytics and data applied to everyone, um, including um, communities and, and, and patients. But you know, really um, making that data available, making the information about the data available in a way that constitutes open science is, is the next big leap. And it, it fuels all of the next scientific discoveries and artificial intelligence and other technologies. So the next slide just tells you a little bit about um, some of our NIH, NIH strategic plan and our global objectives. You can see that there are three big areas in research, foundational science, 
to treatments and innovations and cures, to research capacity and workforce and infrastructure development, and to um, stewardship and partnership. And then there are a number of cross-cutting themes, and I'm over there on the very far right in data science. Um, just an FYI, that um, not only do we have the NIH strategic plan, we also have an NIH data science strategic plan, the RFI, um, has just closed, and we are now uh, finalizing that plan. You should expect to see that uh, certainly by this summer, and I'm really excited to, to, to showcase that new plan, but can do that today. So let me go next to the slide and tell you about what I can talk about today, which is what we have been doing over the past five years to really support this, this uh, idea and concept of open science, in particular data science. So I'll talk about the General Repository Ecosystem Initiative and, and support for repositories and knowledge bases across NIH. I'll cover very quickly FAIR software and software sharing guidelines. And then to talk about um, the work we're doing in stewardship and sustainability of data assets, including our data management center of excellence, and some of the work we've done in partnerships with, for example, FASAB and um, DataSite. So those are just a few of the things I can talk about, but there's tons of work going on across NIH and across our 27 institute centers and offices, for which my office is a coordinating glue. We have a small budget, and with that budget, we hope to make big changes. So the next slide is, you know, why do we care so much about data? Like, what's the value to the research community? What's the value to science and to society in general? Well, it doesn't surprise you, you know this already, that it validates our research results. Making high value data sets accessible fuels the next generation of discovery. We want to fuel the future of research directions and increase opportunities um, both for citation of data and for collaboration around data. And you'll see a lot of activities in terms of reusing existing data, improving data, making it AI and FAIR ready by um, imputation, for example. We also want to do another activity with our ability to share data. We want to trans you know, foster transparency and accountability to the taxpayers and just demonstrate that we have a strong stewardship and sustainable plans um, for our data and data assets that we are effectively and efficiently investing taxpayer dollars in data that really reap the benefits to them. And of course, we want to reap benefits for researchers and research participants who are contributing their data to our clinical and uh, observational outcomes. We want to support appropriate uh, projections of research uh, participants' data. So uh, we have a lot of activities that we're doing to create this culture of data sharing. And the next slide um, is really the biggest change that we've made that I'm sure you're all aware of, which is our data management and sharing policy and the request that investigators submit a data management and sharing plan with their application for funding. And this can be your R01, your P30, or your contract, or your other transactional authority uh, application, an OTA. So you know, our data management and sharing policy is fairly broad. It encompasses all of our research activities, intramural and extramural. It doesn't uh, encompass infrastructure or training, of course. Um, We've made a lot of progress. We're still learning about how to effectively uh, enhance data sharing through these data management sharing plans. And you'll hear just a few of the activities that we're doing. And everything that I say after this slide is supporting this policy. This is um, our number one goal. If you see the new strategic plan for data science, it is the top goal and it is a, a very prominent goal of my office. And not only my office, but all of the Institute Centers and offices at NIH, I just want to call out, and I'll try to point it out as we go along, the strong partnership we have with the National Library of Medicine, as well as the Office of Extramural Research. So the next slide tells you a little bit about just some of the activities we're doing to support open science and fair data at NIH. And the first activity is, it's kind of hidden there. It says, uh, implement consistent capabilities, and then there's a not Link. And really what that is, is it's a supplemental to the NIH data management and sharing policy. And it's instructing researchers, you know, what are some guidelines and, and best practices in selecting a repository to share your research results. And we encourage investigators to select a data repository that 
exemplifies and aligns with the OSTP desired characteristics for a data repository, um, including a repository that may be supported by NIH or by any federal agency or private sector um, or even institutional repository, aligning with these desired characteristics really promotes that concept of open science and fair data. Um, so I hope that you will look at that notice. We want to and will enhance our ability to search and discover NIH from the data. There are a number of really cool activities happening, both at the National Library of Medicine, which will be, um, if you hear Dr. Bertinelli's uh, discussions, it will be the home of how you find and search and use data, as well as partnerships with NSF on the Open Knowledge Network. We want to enhance and conduct outreach and training for fair data and data practices, including, um, you know, helping reproducibility of research using data. And we want to foster communities to sustain research software. So you'll see on the far right, a few activities that I'm going to highlight today that really exemplify the concept of open science and fair data and NIH. And let me just go to the next slide. And here's how we're partnering with the National Library of Medicine. And I just want to thank my colleague, Mariam Zagalam Haram um, from NLM, who prepared the slide. There are a number of really great opportunities to look at data and open science at NLM. For example, um, the CDE repository. CDEs are a way to structure question and answer format in clinical and observational research. There's a a wonderful opportunity to weigh in on the concept of common data elements and the idea of aligning some of these to consistency uh, and with the USCDI plus um, standards. You'll see that is an RFI, which I can put in the link because I don't have it handy here on the slide. There's also other activities that we work across NIH to support the NIH comparative genomics uh, resource, as well as um, works to modernize uh, clinicaltrials.gov. What I wanna highlight is the, in the next slide, and that is um, led by NLM, but it's an NIH-wide activity. It's the Trans-NIH Biomedical Informatics Coordinating Committee. Some of the outputs of the Coordinating Committee include a governance for CDEs, but importantly, they include resources that researchers can use to discover not data sharing, um, repositories and knowledge bases. And so there's a link there. You know, if you get nothing else from my talk, maybe some of these links will be helpful because if you're looking for how you might want to share your data, there are options for you. And this is my go-to place, as well as the resource called sharing.gov um, from NIH, um, which will uh, point you to resources to share your, your data. The next slide is what we're doing to provide sort of an ecosystem of data science activities in the repository world. And this is the General Repository Ecosystem Initiative. We call it the GRAY. General repositories are an awesome place to share data, especially if there isn't a, a community-led data repository. Like, for example, in my community, it was the Protein Data Bank. Um, if you don't have that community established and led repository, this is an awesome way for you to, to comply with the concept of open science and data sharing. There's a number listed here at the top of options for you, but what we want to do is to establish a common set of cohesive and consistent capabilities and services that span all of these general repositories as well as social infrastructure to really just start the discussion of how do you work together in a repository world. We also want to, of course, train researchers and help them adopt fair data practices and principles to better share and reuse their data. I encourage you to look at the Zenodo um, output of the gray. Uh, we have done activities such as common metadata fields. Um, one of them that are important for the agency here is just being able to link your data to your grant. Um, that would be an awesome thing for you and for us to really show the impact of the data management sharing policy. Um, of course, we want to um, normalize and compare metrics across the repositories. We want to think about ways in which we can connect researchers to research outputs via PIDs. You know, Orchid ID for is just one example. And finally, we want to basically increase the community of data sharing through teaching and learning materials. So this is just one of the activities. Um, that we're supporting. The next one on the next slide is very specific funding opportunities for communities 
who want support for either developing a new biomedical data repository and knowledge base. I just came back from a wonderful meeting at UCSF, and it turns out that there isn't really a good repository for um, bone and cartilage and connective tissue data. So I just found out a, a good opportunity here. Um, and there's a uh, funding opportunity for those who are very well established biomedical data repositories. And I mentioned the PDB, but there's others such as Unipro, which is funded by this initiative. What are some of the objectives of uh, our funding opportunities? Well, of course, we want to support data repositories as repositories, acknowledging their importance, that they're core and vital assets to our biomedical uh, research ecosystem. We want to encourage and adopt fair data practices aligning to the OSTP desired characteristics. We want to support the compelling and different uh, stages of biomedical data repository life cycle. So we're managing these in a life cycle um, approach. And uh, what are some of the requirements for a researcher who might want to apply to these uh, funding announcements? You really have to de develop a scientific impact and the impact is dependent on the stage. But if you're an established repository, global impact is important. We really want to see you look at resource management practices and aligning with the resource life cycle concept. We want you to um, engage your communities and your, your journals. And we want to really think about what does it mean to have a trustworthy governance, to have long-term preservation, and to think about policies of data access, privacy, and ethics. So that's uh, some funding announcements for you to think about. The next slide is just a shout out to our partnership with FASEB. And FASEB has a wonderful program called DataWorks, explanation point. Um, here, the prize is to recognize and reward leaders in data sharing and reuse, and to create opportunities for the broader research community to really learn and highlight their achievements. And so we've been running this for uh, two years now. And um, so we are up to a million dollars, but we're gonna keep going. And in fact, the next, um, prize will reopen in May of 2024. That's just two months away. I don't have an exact date, but stay tuned. The next slide will just tell you a little bit about what we have done. You can see the number of teams and the number of people and the number of countries who all you know, participated in the challenge. And if you just hit the button, there'll be a link um, that you just do next slide. Okay, yep, there's the, and the next, sorry, this one is animated. I didn't realize there were so many animations. I just want to highlight our um, last 2023 grand prize winner, which is the COVID-19 Cancer Catalyzing Collaboration. It is a collaboration across 126 different cancer institutes in North America. It's the largest registry of its kind. It has a, almost 20,000 cases. Um, and what was really cool about this is that the primary submitter and the team lead is I think a graduate student. So when I say this is for a broad community of participants, it really is a broad community. And I just wanna acknowledge the awesome work that um, the team has done uh, in the cancer consortium. The next slide is how um, we are supporting our data repositories and knowledge bases to really embrace that concept of reusable, citable, Fair data is through our partnership with DataSite. DataSite um, is an ability for us to mint digital object identifiers as one way for a persistent identifier of digital data objects. Any institute, center, and office at NIH, it can and, and most are consortium members under an umbrella consortium. We're the lead organization for this. Um, through that membership, their repositories can mint DOIs. And we partner with OSTI, the Department of Energy's Office of Science and Technology Information. They serve as the connective glue between our, our institutes and our databases and data sites. So they, they really provide those support services so that we can actually um, accomplish the goals of making data more findable, accessible, and reusable. The next slide, and I'm coming towards the end here, is just a, a an impact, and mostly this is uh, for our NIH uh, community and our internal community, is our data management sharing uh, center of excellence. It provides opportunities to um, create guidelines, best practices. It hosts a number of engaging events for the research community and training on data management and sharing practices and, and plans. And it also helps NIH internal uh, staff to um, 
to have tools to help assess those, those plans. Now, they're just tools and, and guidelines. The program managers do make the assessments themselves. Quickly, I'll just tell you that we have, next slide, because I know we're coming in time. We have our um, best practices for sharing research software. Uh, it's an opportunity to hear about our goals for researchers who are developing software to provide transparency and rigor and reproducible software to track the investments we have in NIH software by providing a consistent metadata set for software that you can share through GitHub or others. We certainly want you to share your code um, when possible, and we want others to be able to reuse your code. Stay tuned. There'll be two funding announcements that provide a support for research software engineers, as well as sustainable software that uh, basically advances biomedical and behavioral research. And the last slide is um, my shout out to my colleagues across the federal agencies led um, by NSF is the Proto-OKN Network, the Open Knowledge Network. It's an interconnected network of knowledge graphs that supports a broad range of application domains. Of course, we're, our goal is biomedical and behavioral research. We support the, the theme called um, the fabric, which is basically knitting all these knowledge graphs together into an interconnected fabric or knowledge graph that help link our, our databases and our knowledge bases. So uh, it's just been a fantastic opportunity to work with NSF and my shout out to Chaitin and his team. I can't wait to see um, what comes of the OKN. And with that, the last slide is my way of thanking you and hoping that you'll stay in touch with us and engage with us in any different platform, LinkedIn, um, Twitter, email. We have a newsletter that goes out once a week. You can hear more about what's happening in the Institute, centers and offices, their funding opportunities. We have seminars. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to you, Chris, and thank you again for the invitation. Yeah, thank you. And I think you have a question uh, waiting for you. and. Uh in the Q and A. Um, I thought there was another one, but maybe Martin uh, answered it <laughs> for you. But uh, I think you have at least one uh, Q Q question there that you can answer in the interim, but we'll we'll get to questions later. Um, I'll move on to, to Brian Hitson uh, at the DOE if you wanted to introduce yourself. Brian, I, um, I can share your slides if you, okay? Yes, please I will, do. I will find your slides and I will, Sorry, I have to hunt these down. There we go. Wait, those are Susan's. Got it. Uh, it might have been mine. I just wanted it in slideshow mode when you find it. There you go. Oh, I'm still seeing hers, actually. Um, Interesting. I'm, I'm seeing DOEs. Uh, if you'll if you'll just put it in slideshow mode, I don't know if you're seeing still seeing hers. Yeah, I'm still seeing hers uh, for some reason. I, so let me. I see yours, Brian. Uh, uh, if, if others are seeing mine, then uh, Chris, you. It's may a not strange see. quirk. I still <laughs> see Susan's. Uh, so I don't know, Martin. Do you want to? I, I know you had your. Maybe you had the slides uh, up, or Brian, if you want to. Try it, uh, who, but it's a strange. Who had them up before? Too. Was that was that you, Brian? No, I didn't have them up before. Um, so well, you should know. be able to share. There, do you see that green share screen button? I do. I see that. I just want to make sure that I have the file itself. But uh, if Chris's uh, slides slides are visible to everyone, he may not be able to see able to see them. But I could tell him. <laughs> to advance I them. I found I found the quirk. So. Uh, um, so yeah, I, um, I found it out. So I think I can share now with everyone. Um, so here we go. Sorry about that. No problem. Uh, if, you'll, if you'll get a slideshow mode, we can see them in a good presentation <laughs> style. So yeah, ready, ready are, for you, you. Are you, I'm seeing it in, in, a, in a non slideshow mode. Can you get it into a slideshow mode? No, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> Another quirk. <laughs> um, yeah, Martin, I am. Martin, what are you seeing? Are you seeing them in the slideshow or a regular view? I was seeing it in the regular view like you, Brian. Brian, I've got your slides. I could put them up. If you don't mind, yeah, I know, Martin, if you could. Uh, I, I don't know. There's some quirks happening here. So 
Yeah. Uh, give me just one second. We'll deal with it. Thank you all for your accommodation. Uh, shucks. Here we go. <laughs> okay, sorry, I just had to download them. Uh, Brian, all right, no, this is, here we go. Are you seeing it now, Brian? It's coming through, yeah. If you'll just put that in slideshow mode, I'll be good, I think. Dang it. Why is it? It's doing the same thing to me. Okay, hang on. Uh, there you go. There you go. It looks good for me. If it's if okay, it's for everyone go else. for it. Go okay. for it. <laughs> I'll put my camera. Uh, take. Uh, let's see here. Uh, if you can, if they can switch to my camera view, that would be good. <laughs> Martin looks I'm better. Seeing I'm seeing you, Brian. Are you seeing me? Is everyone else seeing me? Yeah, we can see you, Brian. Okay, because I was seeing Martin. Uh, so I, I'd, I'd rather look at Martin than myself. So that, that'll work for me. Uh, all right. Um, hope everyone was uh, patient with our, our technical glitches there. Uh, very uh, happy to be here and uh, present the Department of Energy's progress in open science. First and foremost, though, I, I really do want to uh, express appreciation and my pleasure with being with my colleagues from NIH and NSF, Susan and Martin, uh, two, two fabulous agencies making such great progress as you heard from them in their uh, in their presentations and also appreciated, appreciated their mentions of their touch points to our partnerships uh, with them on, on, on a number of areas. So thank you for that. Um, also want to thank the uh, Center for Open Science and NASA for pulling off this wonderful conference. Uh, Martin mentioned this earlier, but I've learned so much myself uh, and uh, really learned a lot from it. So uh, thank you for the, all the organizers of that. Um, obviously, at a government-wide level, we couldn't have done so much we've done in, in public access and open science without the White House and the Office of Science and Technology Policy. Uh, Miriam Zering Halam there uh, has done such a great job. Uh, coordinating interagency activities in that regard and, and going even further back from Miriam, Dr. Chris Markham was such a great leader and, and helping to get the Nelson memo finally issued. So really appreciate the White House's leadership on this. And uh, I would be really remiss if I didn't also uh, acknowledge the leadership in the in the, DU, in the Department of Energy, uh, all the way from the secretary this, to the undersecretaries to the Office of Science. Uh, without their support, we couldn't have done what we did. And so much of, of the progress that DOE has made uh, emanates from my organization, the Office of Scientific and Technical Information, OSTE. Uh, and so I really want to have a shout out to my colleagues at OSTE who made so much of this progress possible. Uh, thank you. Next slide. So I always like to start out with this kind of a 30,000 foot view of DOE and, and our mission. Uh, DOE is a very complex agency with uh, several prong, key prongs to its mission. Uh, one of those prongs is how we invest in energy sciences of different kinds. Uh, and about $15 billion out of our total R&D budget is for the research and development purpose. And of course, that money is allocated to us uh, through the appropriations process to our multiple program offices within DOE. And then that funding is allocated out to our 17 national laboratories, to many hundreds of grantee institutions and universities. All of them are making major scientific breakthroughs and technology advancements and so forth. And their knowledge is recorded in the various forms of scientific and technical information that you see here. Uh, publications of different kinds, software, data, patents, and so forth. About 50,000 such STI products gen uh, annually are generated from that $15 billion R&D R &D investment. Excuse me. Uh, next slide, please. And so uh, I mentioned earlier why it's such a pleasure to be here with Susan and Martin and uh, the trio of, uh, of our three agencies uh, this pie chart shows that out of the entire government, uh, we three are generating close to 75% to of the total journal article output from federal funding. And of course, uh, many, many other agencies are also contributing 
uh, major shares to that. So uh, DOE's in, in that third position of the triumvirate here, but definitely contributing to that 75 percent. Uh, and, and I should acknowledge, acknowledge that journal articles are just one piece of open science and the research outputs there. There are many other forms, software, pub, uh, data sets, and so forth. But for the journal article, this kind of shows you how the breakout of that occurs. Next slide, please. So we've heard a lot about the Nelson memo. Of course, every, that's on everyone's minds uh, from the 2022. Uh, but uh, all of the public access mandates really do emanate from that original public access mandate uh, from OSTP in 2013, what was known as the Holdren Memo, uh, laying out expectations for agencies to develop a public access plan about how they would make their scholarly publications more accessible and also increase access to their digital research data. And so, uh, like with the Nelson memo, the first thing, thing we had to do was develop a public access plan, which addressed those key components of the memo. And uh, in the realm of publications, we built a model around the author's submission of accepted manuscripts to us within uh, 12 months of publication. And this is really kind of the green OA model uh, where uh, they are able to submit uh, the, public, the accepted manuscript to us. Uh, we do we do that through what's called the government purpose license, where we retain a license to the copyrighted version of the accepted manuscript, and we have the authority to collect and, and distribute that for government purposes. Uh, we also allow for the gold open access route, uh, where authors will pay a fee to get published. Uh, we don't prohibit that. That is, is an allowable cost, but our emphasis has been on that green OA model. Uh, our model really builds in, uh, we want to have very collegial and positive relations with the publishers. Uh, we have a voluntary participation of publishers component to our model. This is largely operates through the Chorus Consortium. So where a publisher willingly provides access to uh, a publisher's manuscript or the version of record, we will integrate that into the metadata uh, of our overall collection and provide links out to that in addition to what we obtain from our authors. Uh, and so we do all of this through uh, the discovery to tool DOE Pages, which we established after the Holder Memo. Uh, DOE Pages stands for the Public Access Gateway for Energy and Science. Uh, and it's been a, a key way by which we provide access to these scholarly publications. So that kind of accounts for the publications model piece of it. On the data management uh, side of it, and that was a big, another big part of the Holder Memo, uh, most agencies like DOE have established the data management plan requirements, which ask uh, any funding proposal to describe how they're going to make data more accessible. So we've we've had that requirement in our in our original public access model for many years now. Uh, as we move into the Nelson memo, that will shift into more of a data management and sharing plan. So so some changes there. Uh, next slide, please. So the, the mission and the responsibility for providing public access to DOE's R&D results um, didn't just start with the Holden memo. Our, uh, the mission in DOE to provide access to our R&D results go back, goes back many decades. Uh, Martin mentioned uh, the Manhattan Project and, and uh, some of the things that came out of that. But after the war, of course, the Atomic Energy Commission was set up. And there's always a piece of enabling legislation lays out all the, all the mission and responsibilities when a new agency is formed. And so there was very clear language there where um, uh, the agency needed to provide access to its unclassified R&D results. We were trying to find, uh, turn a lot of that Manhattan Project research into peaceful purposes. And that uh, requirement has re been reiterated over the years with each successive agency. So AEC uh, turned into IRTA, the Energy Research and Development Administration, and then it turned into uh, the Department of Energy. This was in 1977. And so each, each enabling legislation talks about uh, the responsibility to provide public access to it, and other pieces of legislation have reiterated that. And, I, and the quote that I have here from the Energy Policy Act of 2005 talks about that. So we've had this mission going all the way back to 1947, and we have this umbrella search tool called OSTI.gov, which captures that from all the way back to the Manhattan Project, to the 47, to the present. And uh, so it has over 3 million Department of Energy research records expanding that period of time. 
Uh, what happened with the Holder memo uh, and and uh, NIH had a little bit of a leap on other agencies that they were they were actually getting into the journal article space prior to other agencies. But the Holder memo really opened up authority for agencies to provide full text access to the journal articles that result from their federal funding. Uh, previously, we had only been providing metadata about that, but not the full text itself. And so, again, we introduced uh, DOE Pages as our agency uh, repository and discovery tool for finding that. And we've now achieved uh, upwards of 200,000 articles in DOE Pages. And the next slide will show the uh, pie chart uh, of the actual year-over-year -year growth in the quantity of accepted manuscripts and journal articles in DOE Pages. I mentioned on that pie chart earlier that we generate around 25,000 articles per year. We're not totally comprehensive. You know, we don't get all the submissions from our researchers. Uh, we're continually work doing, working to improve that. Improve that. But the, uh, the uh, bar chart here shows year over year, we're roughly in that 25,000 uh, range of uh, additions each year to uh, what is in DOE pages. Next slide, please. So yesterday, uh, especially in some of the sessions I heard, we talked about like, what are some of the impacts? How can we measure the benefits of public access? And there are lots of different ways of doing that. So here I've just picked out one example, which I think is kind of interesting. This is a, an article from uh, a journal, Science, in 2023, and uh, a little bit busy on the visuals here, so I kind of explained it, but on the upper visual, uh, you see sort of a dark a dark blue line and a, and a more faded uh, gray line, and then sort of that red vertical line in 2014. And that's when we really put uh, the requirement on our national labs and our grantees to start providing uh, public act or submitting their accepted manuscripts to us so we could provide them through DOE pages. Uh, so you see after 2014, our national labs really ramped up uh, their efforts in submitting their accepted manuscripts to us. And uh, not every lab is at the same level, but uh, labs have reached a level of about 90% comprehensiveness in, in terms of the number of articles that they submit to us out of the total that they produce. Uh, so a very big uh, uh, level of compliance and success by our labs. And we really, really appreciate their efforts. And then the lower slide here, the lower visual, uh, shows how certain communities have benefited from those increased access, accessible articles from our, from those uh, 17 national laboratories. Specifically, uh, this is in the realm of when people pa file uh, patent applications. So some key communities like inventors and small firms, and these may be companies and others that, that file patents, uh, don't have subscription access at their institutions. They're just private individuals and so forth. So these are really communities that have benefited greatly from, from uh, for example, those national labs increased publications. And so two, two communities, inventors and small firms, are now citing those lab articles at 42% and 49% higher rates than they were before that 2014 vertical line. Uh, again, these communities would not have ac had access to these publications had it not been for the public access mandate. Uh, so a real evidence, I think, and how, especially in the area of technology and commercial innovation and so forth, the public access is benefiting from an economic standpoint, uh, these communities. Uh, you'll note, note at the top of that lower visual that uh, scientists uh, have a 0% uh, increase in the number of citations of these newly available articles. And I don't totally know the answer to that, but I think my, my theory is that scientists are typically working at universities and laboratories and so forth that already had subscriptions to journals. Uh, and so they were, they were more or less benefiting from having that kind of access already. And so this, these newly freely available articles didn't, didn't cause them to cite those articles at any higher rate after 2014 than they were before 2014. Uh, but again, the key point here is we're benefiting communities that haven't had access to it before. Next slide, please. So uh, fast forward, uh, and a lot has been said about the uh, Nelson memo, so, uh, so I'll be, I hope not to be too redundant, but uh, maybe a little bit. Um, so just like the Holden memo, it required agencies to develop a public access plan. 
it it had some key changes. It, it you know it said a lot of a lot of positive things about the Holder Memo. Uh, keep up keep up all the great work that you're doing there. But it changed a number of key things. Uh, one, of course, is the elimination of the 12 month embargo to go to uh, zero embargo to, to provide immediate access to those publications. Uh, and so our new public access plan. Uh, is, has been approved and published. We got, we got that out in June of 2023. Uh, we had submitted it over to OSTP in April, excuse me, in uh, February of 2023. We got approval from, from them in April. So really a big thanks to Miriam for helping us with that. Uh, our model uh, in terms of what we're describing in our public access plan talks about uh, how we're going to achieve this immediate access to the publications, how we're going to maximize right, uh, uh, reuse and and use rights in our publications to enable machine readability for them. Uh, on the data side of things, uh, there's a, a piece in the uh, memo that talks about providing immediate access to any data that's displayed in or underlying a publication. So we will be uh, implementing a data management and sharing plan. So there's some a revision from the previous DMP to now DMSP, uh, where we expect our funding proposals to show us how they're going to achieve immediate access to those kind of data, uh, to data, and and uh, and also to data that doesn't underlie live publication. We want them to address how they're going to make those kind of data sets more accessible. And then the Nelson memo really, for the for the first time, unlike unlike the Holder memo, was really big on persistent identifiers. How agencies are going to integrate persistent identifiers as kind of that connective tissue. And and Susan mentioned that in her presentation. So I'll talk more about that in a minute too. And the Nelson memo wanted agencies to provide a forum, a, a, a channel by which uh, the public can engage with their with agencies on their plans. And so we have this very simple email comments and comments at osti.gov where they can provide that to us. Next slide, please. And so this slide kind of backs backs off some of, of some of the formal requirements from OSTP to get more into the conceptual meaning of open science and what we're doing to really achieve open science in DOE. And I've taken the liberty of uh, lift, lifting this visual from Wikipedia that kind of shows in a visual sense a definition of what open science means and, and gives you all the different components to it. Uh, I took the liberty of annotating this visual to some extent uh, by putting in the yellow boxes there uh, what D where DOE has a very heavy footprint and, and providing more access to open source software, to data, to publications. And then above that, the tools that we're using to make those kinds of research outputs more accessible, DOE code for software, DOE data explorer for data, pages for publications. And then all of that is uh, under the umbrella search tool that I mentioned, osti.gov. And then also took the liberty of drawing this dotted line around uh, persistent, uh, excuse me, around open science called persistent identifiers. And uh, several people have mentioned persistent identifiers or PIDs, uh, and it takes many different shapes. But uh, another illustration I'll show here in a minute uh, just kind of uh, is, is really a good indication of the connective tissue that PIDs play across all this. Uh, next slide, please. Before I do that, uh, I want to just kind of give a shout out to the highlights that DOE contributed to the Year of Open Science. Uh, of course, uh, Miriam mentioned yesterday winners of the Open Science Challenge, uh, which, which are great. Those are some really outstanding activities by other parties uh, in promoting open science. Uh, another part of the Year of Open Science was for agencies themselves to submit highlights that were uh, mentioned at, at, at a certain frequency uh, in, in at open.science.gov. Uh, and so DOE contributed to that as, as our agency contribution. And one of these is the public reusable research data resources. And I wanna give a big shout out to my uh, SC, the Office of Science colleague, uh, Dr. Michael Cook, who really led this effort. And it really is SC's uh, way of, of giving a badge of honor to data repositories, uh, uh, knowledge bases, analysis, analysis platforms, and some others that are just kind of like exemplars or centers of excellence for data stewardship, management, and fair practice. So we really have kind of given the badge of honor to seven uh, of these data resources and data activities. Some of these emanate from our DOE user facilities. Some are from universities. 
uh, but seven so far, and I'm sure others will be added to this. And then the uh, content from those uh, data resources are mostly discoverable in DOE Data Explorer. Next slide, please. Uh, a second highlight that we mentioned, and I, met I mentioned in that open science uh, illustration, DOE code. Uh, DOE has probably, if, if, if not the largest, among the largest uh, collections of uh, scientific software or software that come from our R&D efforts that we've made accessible to the public because uh, software is kind of the, the third leg of the stool of, of publications and data uh, to, to really enable uh, open science and to see, to go beyond the publication, to get to drill down into uh, data and software to uh, really promote reproducibility. So we established DOE code uh, as, a, as one place where you can come and find any kind of software. Uh, we have a very active, and I'll mention that in a second, uh, PID services where we assign PIDs, in this case, digital object identifiers to software to enable uh, that linkage and discovery of it. Uh, our big emphasis is on open source software. So out of 5,500 total projects, 87% of those are open source. And our metadata, for when you go to DOE code, you'll find sort of this burst metadata page that uh, includes, among other metadata elements, links to where uh, that software can be accessed. So when it's in the case of the 87% uh, where, the, where it's open source and the licenses are, are very uh, liberal, uh, you're able to go and use that software directly. If it's closed source software, then the link will give you advice on how you're able to access that software. Next slide, please. And this is kind of a kind of a way to kind of I have only a couple of other slides to kind of close out my presentation, but just to emphasize the the importance of PIDs and persistent identifiers to promoting open science as kind of that connective tissue. And so DOE uh, through my organization, OSTI has taken a very uh, aggressive stance and trying and trying to uh, advocate for PIDs, try to get PIDs integrated into our metadata to really achieve this uh, meaning of open science where you're able to link from publications to data, to software and so forth. And so we have services that we provide to our national laboratories and to other agencies, in fact, where we're assigning PIDs for data, for software, for text documents. We know publishers assign PIDs for articles, but uh, PIDs typically haven't been assigned to things like technical reports or grade literature. So we do that through this service. Uh, the memo talks about requiring PIDs for awards, so we had a pilot project where we worked to do that, and I think that's going to go a long way toward uh, uh, our overall solution. We run the government ORCID, U.S. Government ORCID Consortium, where we're integrating, uh, helping uh, laboratories and others integrate uh, PIDs into their workflows, uh, and so uh, the PIDs for people is really uh, becoming more uh, prevalent. And also PIDs for organizations. We work with Roar, Roar and uh, some of the others that assign PIDs for organizations. We maintain our own authority uh, so that that helps build into our metadata, the accuracy where there may be organizations with different names, but if they have their own PID, uh, that that uh, reduces that ambiguity. So uh, PID, PIDs for organization is a big uh, focus of ours too. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a very busy slide, and I'm sure one that uh, many of you have experienced in your own research, but it just kind of shows uh, how instrumental PIDs are uh, in the research landscape and enabling open science. And so this is, for example, just a metadata page from OSTI.gov or could be from DOE pages, uh, but all the different places where we, are, we have PIDs and you're able to then move out to that related research object or people or organizations uh, and so here you have uh, the PID for the publication, which the publisher has most likely assigned. This, this could also be uh, where we're showing the accepted manuscript. Uh, and the authors, uh, the, if they have ORCID IDs, uh, you're able to uh, link out and see their full complement of publications that, they, that they've produced over time. But most importantly here, I'm, I want to highlight uh, if, if there are data underlying this publication or software that went into the research, OSTI has um, most more often than not assigned the DOI to that. We integrate that into our metadata and you're able to bounce right out to uh, uh, GitHub or, or other places where the, where the software may be or 
big share of the places where the data set may be or at, or at an institutional data repository. Uh, so that really, this is open science in action. This is really where uh, you're able to seamlessly move and it really, really uh, supports the reproducibility and transparency of the research. So uh, this is a uh, uh, next slide, please. This, uh, this just kind of shows how we are making great progress and we're really excited with the development of our new public access plan to contribute to uh, uh, OSTP's expectations. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Um, and thanks, Martin. <laughs> Martin's been asked, answering questions too as he's presenting the slides. So um, yeah, thank you again, Martin. <laughs> For and sorry for the the snafu earlier. Um, I, I I think like one question I'll, I'll look at, I'll because you haven't had a chance to look at the questions. So so Brian, I'll start off with one for you, but it can also be a question for all of you, which is to what extent is the DOE or you know also NSF and NIH funding AI research and how much of it is classified in the labs versus done at research institutions. Great question. Uh, you know, I mentioned when I showed uh, that $15 billion in R&D investments uh, as sort of the one one of the prongs of the multi-prong mission of DOE. Uh, and uh, so, D, you know, DOE has other missions, uh, national security being a big one, and production, production activities uh, that support the national security piece of it. Uh, and, and then there are research that go, there's research that goes into uh, National, national security related uh, efforts uh, in terms of nonproliferation and and uh, just 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 things that uh, aren't appropriate to be published for the general public. And so, you know, very 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 clear processes within DOE. Uh, uh, there there are these risk mat matrices where you kind of put things in, uh, you know, red, yellow, and green uh, as to as to what is appropriate to share. And uh, so, yes, uh, we have. Very good processes for ensuring that that kind of content doesn't get out into this public access open science. Uh, that was that was kind of mentioned in one of yesterday's sessions. So we uh, and the labs have a process by what where they run it through uh, the reviews to see if there are those kind of risks, but also uh, 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 IP concerns and other kind of concerns, privacy concerns. Uh, so we really try to make sure that everything that gets out there is. Uh, fitting uh, and, and going to benefit the broader open science community. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if Martin or uh, you want to respond to that AI question or or Susan, if you have anything as well, but we can I'm move on. I'm sorry, I was typing an answer to some <laughs> of the things in there. Well, I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Uh, it's, it's uh, let me see here, it's gone now, but I can come back to it. It's, um, I think it's down here. Um, it was just around, around uh, yeah, here we go. Um, what extent uh, at DOE, but maybe at, uh, you know, your agencies about uh, what extent is uh, is DOE funding AI, AI research and how much of oh. it is classified in labs versus done at research institutions? And I, I just uh, thought- Huge, huge topic. Yeah. The, yeah. the NSF is um, making major investments. It's one of our huge, our most central investment areas, um, especially focused through the NAIR, the National AI Resource Pilot uh, Program that was announced in January. Um, do a, some Google searches, you'll find lots of, of references to that. Um, while some of the, there are certainly research security concerns in some parts of, of AI research these days, um, the vast majority of it is, um, you know, not restricted. Uh, it's only when uh, some of those those research efforts become, you know, national security secrets or something like that. But the the ninety nine point nine percent of NSF research is open. It is only a very small um, category of of research areas that are are constrained uh, or you know that we we will uh, not share the information. I mean, notably things like quantum cryptography research, uh, biological research that can lead to uh, dual-use biological weapons, that kind of thing. Um, but the vast majority of, of this stuff is, is openly accessible. I can just chime in uh, as well. We are um, 
participants uh, in the National AI Research Resource led by NSF. We are co-leads on what's called NAIR Secure. NAIR Secure is a secure way to access data and resources. It's a co-partnership with DOE in this case. And where we come into play is that we hold a number of uh, patient participant data uh, on enclaves such as the N3C, the National COVID Cohort Collaborative. That is a secure enclave. You do need to have permissioning and control to access. And so for anything in AI that has to deal with patient data, particularly, we are working on um, controlled and secure platforms and access. Not, so, not necessarily classified, but you know, importantly controlled in an inappropriate and high security ways. Absolutely. Personally identifiable information is another um, instance of a prime instance of where data cannot and should not be shared. Um, thank you. So there is another question about um, our government repos uh, of publications working to include their publications in internet searches. So Google Scholar is, 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 is mentioned here, um, possibly as an access option alongside the journals. Um, and I know that actually Google Scholar, if you go into metrics, you can see all the different uh, government agencies that are indexed, but Brian wants to go first. So Brian, you first. <laughs> well, uh, not not necessarily anything unique from uh, uh, NIH and NSF, but uh, really good friends with Anurag Acharya at Google Scholar and and uh, and work working with him uh, quite closely, um, and and not just Google Scholar, but Google and Bing and others. Uh, we uh, go out of our way to. Uh, do as much as we can to enable indexing of our content. And uh, uh, so uh, that really helps with the discovery of that. We learn a lot from them and things. Uh, we've had diff we've had different models within DOE, uh, centralized, distributed. You know, we have the laboratories, the universities. Uh, we have allowed for uh, deposits into institutional repositories where OSTI goes and uh, links to those, in some cases, harvest those for dark archive purposes. Uh, we've learned uh, from the Google scholars of the world that in many cases, uh, that's not satisfactory because uh, uh, they're not always, uh, there may be firewall blocks or other kind of reasons where they're not, not able to uh, uh, go index those fully. And so in our, in our new plan, uh, we're going to try to work through some of those vagaries. And uh, it, it wouldn't surprise me if if, if we're going to expect to, to be harvesting those from uh, institutional repositories uh, so that they are avail available for the Google scholars of the world to index those more properly. And it also it also makes it sets the stage for us to perform analytic analytics on them uh, more easily. So uh, that's the sort of the direction we're heading. And Brian, Mark, answered, Brian answered the question perfectly. Um, the one thing I would add is we have a very collegial relationship with Anurag. He has been uh, very helpful in having a lot of discussions on these topics and exposure of our resources through Google. Um, in fact, we hosted a uh, interagency talk by Anurag uh, just in the last couple months um, to enable agencies to hear from him comprehensively. We, we really appreciate all the work that he does. And just a quick shout out to my colleagues at NLM on uh, the PubMed, PubMed Center. It's a way to look at the um, articles and the full text articles that are archived, not just from our um, funded investigators, but generally from many, many domains of biomedical, behavioral, and clinical research. And uh, just a note out to a really cool application that NLM and CBI developed called PubTators. It's a way to search for information and entities in over six a um, million full text articles in PMC. So this is an AI uh, based um, algorithm that you can actually uh, find information in indexed uh, materials in PubMed. And what was that called again? It's, it's really cool. It's called PubTater. I'll put a link to it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I yeah, I, I believe I, I, Peter, I, I have not heard that one from you okay. before, Susan. You got to check this out. Um, it's yeah. pretty cool. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Learn something new every day. I, I guess like that's the other um, question I had just briefly is that I, I follow your um, newsletter, um, Susan. And, you know, I think 
you, all of you mentioned all these things, all these wonderful things you're working on. And, you know, we, we've mentioned science.gov uh, and other places where you can go and check, but I'm wondering if you have, you know, like if, if you have other resources that you want to uh, provide here, like where we can track what you're doing and uh, um, that are current, uh, because all of us are sort of interested in what you're doing. Yeah, sure. but the sharing.nih.gov, because if you're interested in open science um, and, and our policies, this is this is the best way to communicate with us on, especially on what's required for grantees. Um, but this is a really good way to look at our policies, our materials, our resources, uh, and all of our um, uh, publication access. It's, a, it's in addition to some of the wonderful resources at NLM and NCBI. I, I put our um, public access webpage in the chat. Uh, it is pretty crowded, admittedly, with uh, notifications and uh, links to the various engagements that we've done. But that's the main place that when we have something major that we post it. Um, we also do, you know, obviously, uh, listserv postings to groups of researchers. They, the uh, NSF Office of Legislative and Public Affairs maintains a number of listservs to different scientific communities. And one overall one that is the director's listserv that goes to everybody. Anything major, we put notifications in that as well. Yeah, and we uh, um, we have. Um, I think this goes to your question about uh, monitoring and 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 reporting and so forth. Uh, and DOE kind of has a, a a tell of two cities in terms of the uh, uh, ecosystems that we're doing research in. One is our seventeen national laboratories, which is you know a relatively small number and a, a more centralized uh, environment to be working with. And then there are more, much more distributed. Uh, uh, grantees and so forth. And so we have good systems, metric systems for uh, sort of capturing like where, where is this lab versus lab and so forth. And so we deal with them one on one. You know, we're not trying to <clears throat> uh, put up a wall of shame. Uh, they're all doing well, but I don't want I don't want to single any one of them out. So we kind of deal with them directly. And then we have separate processes by which we deal with the grantees. Um, Happy to happy to sort of report on uh, aggregate aggregately uh, how DOE is doing, but uh, at a, at an institutional level, we probably will not be posting that. Uh, thank you all. Like they're they're uh, as as usual. Martin's answering questions. Uh, there's one that we can answer. When I, I know we can go a little bit over um, if people want to stay on, and we can try to answer some questions. But one at least two of them are for you, Brian. If you can go into Q and A and maybe. Martin and Susan can answer this general question, which I said we can answer live, which is how are agencies working with other stakeholders to support compliance and minimum burden on, on burdens on researchers? You want to uh, start, Susan? Sure, absolutely. Of, co of course, you can see that we're working with um, PASAB and DataWorks. They have a number of different activities, including data salons, which work with their communities on how to develop data management sharing plans and practices and fair data. We've been doing quite a bit of um, seminars and webinars just generally, but we also partner with the, um, the uh, data curation network to provide training. And a lot of that training does happen at the, with institutional librarians, because let me tell you, that might be your go-to place if you want to learn how to make your data open and fair. Um, so we, we've been partnering with societies and, and organizations that can broadly reach much larger communities. And of course, each institute center and office at NIH has their own unique community and, and are engaged in those communities of theirs. Um, some institutes are providing guidelines and sometimes even templates to, to help produce a data management plan or to help um, researchers understand where and how to share data. So it is a definitely a multi-prong approach, uh, both from our office and engaging broadly communities um, and nodal points, as well as institutes who uh, might be developing uh, their own very unique uh, dissemination materials for open and fair data and, and information. We, we just briefly, we do, a, as I mentioned, a lot of different public engagement efforts. Uh, in particular, with uh, we, we have an active um, 
reg and re and fairly regular uh, webinar series with uh, officials from offices of research and sponsored programs at uh, institutions around the country where we announce uh, new procedures, mechanisms, uh, compliance expectations, that kind of thing to um, uh, the re basically the respective uh, individuals at university campuses that are responsible for uh, monitoring that. So um, we could always do more. Um, certainly, but uh, we also do, uh, you know, public as as much time as we have as we can devote to it. We do public engagements that are open, come one, come all, and those are all recorded and up on our website that I put in the uh, chat. Uh, and just if I may, way, uh, uh, Chris, thank you for pointing out the question about the uh, uh, federal purpose license or government purpose license uh, and explaining that a bit. Um, so uh, lawyers, uh, as you can imagine, <laughs> uh, have been heavily involved in these kind of uh, discussions. And so while we enjoy a license to the accepted manuscript, and that gives us the authority to uh, collect it and distribute it and so forth, um, uh, that authority itself does not extend for someone in the public then to take, take that article and redistribute it or uh, do certain kind of derivative works on it and so forth. Most of that is governed under the under the fair use license. So we know that the 2022 uh, memo uh, wanted agencies to continue to move to maximize rights and reuse while still respecting copyright and so forth. So we're still work, uh, looking at that, uh, seeing how uh, certain uh, agreements that uh, authors uh, have with publishers and so forth to be mod modified to maximize that. Um, uh, we uh, very much, the commercialization, commercialization piece of it, um, I don't think there's any any prohibition against uh, somebody finding something on Dewey Pages and then running with that in terms of like uh, uh, moving on out with uh, different commercialization avenues that that could take. Uh, but we do recognize that agencies' current practices, and it's not just a DOE thing, but it's a government-wide thing, uh, uh, the limitations on uh, reuse of, of certain things uh, is one that's still a nut that hasn't been cracked and something that uh, OSTP and other agencies are working on, on talking through. There is, um, it, for those that are interested in this somewhat arcane topic, there will be a, uh, I just got notification yesterday that there's a webinar uh, upcoming that the UC University of California system and the Authors Alliance uh, will be hosting on this topic. So you might contact them for uh, information on that event. I believe that's in April. I saw that too. Thanks, Martin, for bringing that up. Uh, there, there's one more question I think that was at, answered uh, for um, DOE, um, Brian. Um, it's more of a technical question. I think someone else answered it. Uh, but uh, yeah, um, I just wanted to, I, I think we're closing out um, and I wanted to thank all of you um, really for a great informative um, session. Um, really appreciate it. Um, you know, I think again, we were excited to see um, you uh, say yes and, and, and agree to be here and present uh, from this, the team that put on this um, program. Um, I just wanted to thank Center for Open Science again. They're amazing. Um, and uh, I, I, it, particularly Katie Corker, um, she's our ambassador of Quan. So uh, I'm probably making her blush, but she has really just uh, done an amazing job. So thank you all. Um, and uh, look to forward to seeing you out there in open science land. Thank you all for having me. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Chris.